So thank you for joining us. Um, the Pacific School of Religion is proud to announce our spring 2023 Professors of Practice Lecture Series over these past four consecutive Thursdays from February 9th to March 2nd. Uh, this semester, we have been led by Ms. Nicole Lim, a speaker, educator, author, and founder of Freely in Hope, a nonprofit which equips survivors and advocates to be in ending sexual abuse. The Professors of Practice is a free online cross-disciplinary lecture series that brings leaders from social movements, industry, and the arts in conversation with our students and the public. Those interested are encouraged to register for one or more of these lectures through Eventbrite or on the PSR website. I am Professor Leonard McMahon, and over the past four weeks, uh, my course, Pastoral Care for and with Marginalized Bodies, has joined Ms. Lim for lectures based around the theme, Building a Violence-Free World, Caring for Survivors of Sexual Violence in Our Communities. After this lecture, PSR Dean Susan Abraham and I will engage Ms. Lim in conversation, introducing questions from participants. Each lecture will center a theme, but will also incorporate stories from Lim's work, visual poems by survivors, and contemplative practices to ground body, mind, and soul in the difficulty of the topic. In week one's lecture, with the dignity, Ms. Lim discussed how to identify with unfamiliar and uncomfortable stories and how to recognize the local symptoms of a global pandemic of sexual violence. In week two's healing suffering, she explained the harm caused by the cultural silencing of sexual violence, explored holistic healing, and detailed the risks of vicarious trauma. In week three's transforming love, she outlined survivor-led models of transformation, made us aware of new languages and power structures, and shared practices of radical self-love and community care. All these lectures are available on PSR's website. In this final lecture, Ms. Lim will define uh, survivor leadership, stress the importance of such prophetic voices, and underscore the need to value survivors as liberators. She'll highlight organizational models that integrate survivor-led solutions, as well as introduce the steps necessary to move organizations from silencing to uplifting survivor voices. Thus, this evening's lecture is appropriately titled Believing in Liberation. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Nicole Lim via a kind hand gesture of positive reaction. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to actually begin today's class with the examine prayer, which is a Ignatian prayer. And I feel this uh, starting with this um, practice is really fitting with all that we've been discussing over the course of the three weeks the practice of holding the tension of pain and joy together, light and dark, and the constellations and desolations. So I'll invite you to come to a comfortable seat, in your heart, mind, and soul, and body, to enter into communion with God through the practice of the examine. I'll invite you to take three grounding breaths together, which is again, a reminder of the divine breath that flows and moves through us. And at your own pace, taking an inhale for six seconds and exhaling for six seconds. And we'll do this together for three rounds. And as you breathe, notice the cool air moving through your nostrils on the inhale and the warmth of your breath on the exhale, a reminder of the warmth that we can offer to this world. The examined prayer is five phases, and I will guide you in silent prayer through each of the five phases. In this first phase, we recognize the presence of God in our midst, wherever we might be, whether it be at home, on campus, for us. Perhaps you were 
at work or in your car trying to find some silent respite. Wherever you are, we recognize that God's divine power is moving in us and through us, bringing us together across time zones, across difference, across shared experiences. In the second movement, we move toward the understanding of gratitude. And think upon this last 24 hours, what is something that you are grateful for? Perhaps it's the ability to show up to class today. Grateful for your body that woke you up to get you to this place. Grateful for the experience that we've been having together that PSR so graciously extending. Grateful for resources and connections that allowed us to be in this wonderful class, in this community, communing together. I'm grateful for our community outside of this class, our families, our friends, our mentors, our children, our support systems, our community that keeps us accountable. In this third movement, we move toward our consolations, the things that drew us closer to God in the course of the day. Where did you experience God today? Where did you feel closest to God today? Where did you feel a sense of love, of joy? of beauty? Was there a moment where you felt such joy that you lifted your hands in praise or you sung a song of praise? Where did you feel closest to God today? In this Fourth movement, we encounter our desolations, the moments where we might have felt far from God, where we may have experienced pain or suffering, despair or mourning, grief, traumatic memory. Where do we feel far from God that perhaps we were not our best selves? That our own pain or anxiety or frustration or anger got the best of us. And we were not able to access divine love in that moment. Where did you feel far from God today? And in recognizing our desolation, we may find that God was also present in the desolation, in the suffering. God is near. In despair, God is also near. And in this final phase, we move toward hope. What do you hope for? For a better tomorrow? What do you look forward to towards the week? How do you hope to see your own liberation or liberation in context of your community? How do you hope to move forward in this new week, aware of the ways that we can hold these juxtapositions of pain and joy together? How can we respond instead of react, being reminded that God is present, in every moment with us, moving, living, and breathing in and through us. And we'll close our prayer with these words from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Discovering more joy does not save us from the inevitability of hardships and heartbreaks. In fact, we may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily too. Perhaps we are just more alive. Yet as we discover more joy, 
we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without becoming hard. We have heartbreak without being broken. And we'll just sit with these words for another three breaths together. When you're ready, you can come back to the larger room, hopefully feeling that sense of gratitude and hope as we further engage in our topic of liberation. Amen. As we culminate our journey today in this fourth phase, we must remember that we are not free until everybody's free. This journey toward liberation must include those deemed marginalized, overlooked, and powerless. In fact, not only must we include, we must be led by them. The act of liberation does not simply mean a freeing of the soul or conversion in the religious sense, as many colonizers have falsely thought. The act of liberation is a radical shift toward, toward socioeconomic equity, not just through the provision of resources but through shared power and decision-making. You've heard the term, give a fish to a man and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. But if the man owns the lake, he'll feed generations after him. But it's also said that if you educate a man, you educate the individual. Whereas if you educate a woman, you educate the community. And I would argue that if a woman owns the lake, she will build socioeconomic equity for the generations of her entire community. An example of this would be Mackenzie Scott's philanthropic work that is providing millions of unrestricted funds without oppressive grant processes. This act of liberation is a process, a journey, an experience of mind, body, and soul, evidence in the metamorphosis of the butterfly who is free to fly, to be a source of image, a source and image of beauty and delight. The butterfly provides life-giving food through pollination that actually extends farther than the bee's pollination. The butterfly is an essential part of our ecosystem because it's an indicator of climate health. The more butterflies we have in this world, the healthier our ecosystem will be. And similarly, Oscar Romero said, the glory of God is a poor person fully alive. The more fully alive and liberated people we have in this world, the healthier our world will be. Isaiah 61 shows us this full trajectory of liberation. In the first phase, it says that the free, the, the oppressed will be free. In the second phase, that God will comfort and provide for those who suffer. Third, that God will transform ashes, mourning, and despair into beauty, joy, and praise, so that finally they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Those who were freed from oppression are to be a display of splendor of the glory of God, rebuilding, restoring, and renewing places of devastation. As pastoral leaders, we are called to overturn power structures so that those who were once oppressed will be the ones leading us all toward liberation. And we have an invitation to recognize survivors of sexual violence as powerful liberators in our communities. And this trajectory is supported by both science and spirituality. Trauma, when we experience trauma, trauma affects the brain, which triggers physical and emotional responses. 
it shuts down higher higher functioning parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which navigates rational thinking and regulates emotional responses. It also impedes the hippocampus's functionality, which is responsible for memory and differentiating past from present. With consistent exposure to trauma, the hippocampus shrinks, which is why forgetfulness and memory loss often occurs with survivors. But this is also the brain's way of protecting us from traumatic memory. When trauma occurs, the amygdala flares up, which triggers a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. This helps us in survival mode, but it impedes rational thinking. When the amygdala becomes hyperactive over time, more signs of post-traumatic stress disorder are present, which are depression, anxiety, impaired functionality, suicidal thoughts, nightmares, insomnia. As survivors of sexual violence in our communities are constantly exposed to unsafe conditions, it becomes more and more difficult to focus to dream, to reimagine something different when the brain survival system is constantly over-functioning to protect them from past trauma. But through neuroplasticity, the brain can actually physically rewire itself to heal through spiritual practices such as meditation, gratitude, and communal care. Our brains can make more neural, neural connections to help it get out of this fight or flight mode. God literally created our brains to heal itself and our spiritual practices that are so common in our religious um, institutions actually have the potential to nurture that healing. Psychologist Judith Herman's research sh shows that there are three stages to trauma recovery. First is education, stabilization, and safety. This helps to normalize feelings that result after trauma. And this is when the trauma survivor is getting basic health needs, which include living in safe physical environments. They also practice building uh, relationships of trust in context of community. The second phase is processing, remembering, and mourning. And this processing can happen through cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling sessions and or through somatic therapies that I mentioned, such as EMDR, yoga. Survivors also practice the integration of grief, which separates experiences of past from the present. There, therefore, that's when survivors can create a new story where they can now share stories with each other of doing the silencing, the culture of silencing. And finally, the final phase, building meaning and reconnection. As survivors gain authority over their traumatic memories, they are able to respond as opposed to react. They are able to build meaning that integrates trauma into their life as opposed to overwhelming them. And they can start building new relationships that foster wholeness and healing. Also, part of meaning making for survivors, according to Judith Herman's research, is that they find a survivor mission through social action. And this is really interesting. So Judith Herman writes, most survivors seek the resolution of their traumatic experience within the confines of their personal lives, but a significant minority as a, as a result of the trauma feel called upon to engage in a wider world. These survivors recognize a political or religious dimension in their misfortune and discover that they can transform the meaning of their personal tragedy by making it the basis of social action. While there is no way to compensate for an atrocity, there is a way to transcend it by making it a gift to others. The trauma is redeemed only when it becomes the source of a survivor mission. In this mission, social action offers the survivor a source of power that draws upon her own initiative, energy, and resourcefulness, but which magnifies these qualities far beyond her own capabilities. It offers her an alliance with others based on cooperation and shared purpose. Participation in organized, demanding social effort calls upon the survivor's most mature and adaptive coping strategies of patience, anticipation, altruism, and humor. It brings out the best in her. In return, the survivor gains the sense of connection with the best in other people. In the sense of reciprocal connection, the survivor can transcend 
the boundaries of a particular time and place. Social action can take many forms from concrete engagement with particular individuals to abstract intellectual pursuits. Survivors may focus their energies on helping others who have been similarly victimized on educational, legal, or political efforts to prevent others from being victimized in the future. Common to all these efforts, the dedication to raising public awareness. Survivors understand that the natural human response to horrible events is to put them out of mind. But this is key. They also understand that those who forget the past are often condemned to repeat it. It is for this reason that public truth telling is the common denominator of all social action. And this sounds like liberation theology to me. When a survivor moves through these stages of recovery, they're processing meaning making and reconnection, which heals trauma in the brain and concurrently the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which then moves the survivor to the opposite, which is called uh, post-traumatic growth. So here's a really helpful diagram that I think encompasses a lot of what we've talk been talking about in the past couple of weeks. So we move from normal life and experience of trauma entering into this sense of darkness, the dark night of the soul, suffering, challenges. In the abyss, there is a sense of spiritual and emotional death where there's a, um, an opportunity to create new meaning. They are assisted through the helper, the mentor, the pastor, the guide, the counselor. And through that comes hope transformation, which then lends toward post-traumatic growth. There are five elements of post-traumatic growth. First is personal strength, where survivors are able to handle difficulties with wisdom and maturity. Second is building closer relationships where they find a new sense of belonging and interdependence with others. Third is a greater appreciation for life where they have a greater sense of gratitude, hope, kindness, love, teamwork, and leadership dynamic. Fourth is they experience new possibilities where they're able to accomplish bigger goals with a higher sense of authority and a stronger sense of self and confidence. And lastly, spiritual development. They are able to readjust their spiritual beliefs to encompass the story of trauma and to not be overwhelmed by it. In the Body Keeps Score by neuroscience, neuroscientist Bessel van der Kolk, he mentions one of the components of healing from trauma, which includes communal rhythms in religious institutions. He says, Religious rituals universally involve rhythmic movements from davening at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem to the sung liturgy and gestures of the Catholic Mass. Music was the backbone of the civil rights movement. Music binds together people who might individually be terrified, but who collectively become powerful advocates for themselves and others. Along with language, dancing, marching, and singing, these are all uniquely human ways to install a sense of hope and courage. Looks like the church. So to test this theory, I conducted a survey with my staff members, 20 staff members across Kenya and Zambia, to learn what, what were the critical com components that supported their journey towards transformation. And at the top was a sense of spiritual understanding. As survivors of sexual violence heal, there is a deep spiritual component, a connectedness to a higher power as a life force. And a, and a divine awareness of God's presence, upholding them in their suffering. These spiritual practices of meditation, contemplation, dancing, singing, communal care, hospitality, are deeply rooted rituals embedded in our faith traditions. Through these practices, our sanctuaries can offer a safe space, a firm foundation for survivors to commune together in healing. And in their healing and transformation process, they can have the potential to become leaders and liberators who are achieving new possibilities and committing to social justice movements. Both the scientific phases and the spiritual practices move and flow together, leading toward a liberation of body, mind, and soul for themselves and for entire communities and cultures. As pastoral leaders, it is our calling to nurture these practices and provide opportunities for survivors to be in safe spaces. I'll talk more about this later. 
the brain is constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly healing itself. Because healing looks different for every survivor, methods of healing will look different for every survivor. The outcome will also look different for every survivor. Judith Herman said that a significant minority engages in the survivor mission, but in my observation, it is the significant majority. However, I want to be very clear. This does not mean that the onus is only on the survivor to bring about communal liberation. It would be cruel to sit back and allow these violent systems to perpetuate itself while forcing the survivor to heal violence that we cause. As pastoral leaders, we have an opportunity to actively engage in the work of liberation that is already happening, whether we're mindful to it or ignorant to it. As Lila Watson said, our liberation is bound to each other. Our healing is bound to each other. Again, the movement toward communal liberation of working together requires this communal effort of power sharing and equitable resourcing. And I do believe that there are necessary rhythms or seasons of engagement in social action and rest as an act of um, resistance against oppression, to quote Tricia Hersey's work um, as the founder of the NAP ministry. Chanel Miller, who was the survivor in the Stanford University case against Brock Turner in 2015, used Kintsugi art for her book cover as a symbol of her healing. Kintsugi is the Japanese art form of taking broken pieces of pottery and mending it back together with pure gold, making the item more expensive, more beautiful, and more exquisite than it was before. The redemption process of mending together brokenness is a lifelong journey that requires time, intentionality, holistic support, and love. Just like the broken pieces of pottery must draw closer together to draw closer together to make the piece whole again, we must also draw closer to stories of pain so that we can experience joy redeemed. But if we were to label it only as a broken item, and throw it away, we limit its purpose, and we're unable to see the process of restoration. Similarly, do we see survivors in our community in a way that limits their leadership and voice? Things fall apart. Systems fail women, perpetrators fail humanity, advocates fail survivors, leaders in power fail those who've been marginalized. Our systems are broken, but how can we as a global community work together to mend these broken things back together better than it was before. The art of Kintsugi is a beautiful metaphor for how our community should look like. Survivors who have experienced a sense of brokenness due to trauma have put their broken pieces back together again, creating something new. These new neural connections are literally healing the brain, metanoia, as we discussed last, last week, transforming the mind, body, and soul, inspiring social action, and a unique understanding of healing. And this healing process is what informs a perspective that is beautiful, powerful, and liberating. This renewed perspective informs their transformative approach to leadership, power sharing, and communal care. Rebuilding restoring and renewing places that have been devastated by violence. And for this reason, survivors of sexual violence have the potential to be the most powerful liberators in our world. But are we listening? Last week, I talked about a program called Mokia, which means Queens of Swahili, which Mara designed and initiated. And this picture um, is a photo of Serafina, who was in our first alumni, who was our first cohort in this um, program. And, she, and we met her in 2018. And her story is a perfect example of Kintsugi, of redemption, and of liberation. Yeah, my name is Sarafina Njoki. I'm 27 years old. 
my mom was jobless sometimes we could sleep hungry it was so bad for me to see my mom like crying in front of me because we don't have anything to eat i started selling my body when i was 16 years old I decided to go to the street so that I can be able to pay for my school fees and to cater for my needs. Yeah, and it was making me to feel very, very bad. I've been sexually abused two times in the street. I started taking drugs. I was so much broken. When I got pregnant, like I was thinking like, should I abort this child? Or what am, what am I going to tell my parent or my community? I gave birth to a baby boy. Life started becoming harder and harder and harder for me. I started remembering in school like the career which I was telling my teacher that I want to become a, do a doctor and looking at myself, I'm a sex worker. So when I was in the street, I met a lady from Freeling Hope. She's Pauline and she introduced me with other 15 women to join the Malkia program. Malkia has fulfilled my dreams in doing catering. They surprised me and she told me that Sarafina, prepare yourself tomorrow you are going to class. I cried. I cried at night telling myself that my dreams now is coming into reality. Malkia for me means like to restore our dignity and uh, transformation and to see our inner beauty in us. Kemalkia has been providing a safe space for these women to be empowered. When I graduated from the Malkia program in 2019, I was eager to make a difference in the lives of other women on the street. Freeland Hope hired me as the peer educator for the Malkia program. And now I run the meetings, conduct home visits, and make sure the women are well cared for in their transition to their dream jobs. Malkia is so important to me and other women because it is changing people's life. In the street, people don't see beyond. Yeah, they only see around them. They are enlightening our mind and enlightening our dreams and vision at the same time. And we are seeing beyond. Yeah, because I believe that no woman was meant to be a prostitute. My hope is to see there is no prostitution going on in community. It will be a free community where girls will use their own skills to earn money but not selling their bodies. So what does survivor leadership look like? We've heard of so many different leadership styles. There's servant leadership, there's transformational leadership, there's transactional leadership. And uh, we asked our scholars at Freely and Hope what it means to them. This concept of survivor leadership is anchored on the belief that survivors of sexual violence have the potential to become the most powerful liberators in our communities. Society attempts to silence and take power from women, but in order for liberation to occur, listening to the voices of the marginalized, oppressed, and unheard will provide a greater perspective that brings transformation for our world. At Freely and Hope, we believe that the lived experience of survivors make them the most powerful, proximate, and relevant leaders in providing survivor-centered solutions 
that will change systems of oppression and build a violence-free world. And here are a few things that our scholars created. They just did this exercise actually a couple of weeks ago. So we have healing, coaching, transformation, and training. And this next one is a short video of them explaining um, their diagram and they use the diagram of a butterfly, which I thought was really fitting. These are the wings of the butterfly, this is the body. So the body of the butterfly represents me. Uh, so he explains seeing me and then in brackets, voice, voice. So this means that I will use my voice to, to bring comfort, comfort and joy to others through singing and through my voice by comforting them. Beauty, joy and praise all in one. So we asked our community, about 30 people, staff and scholars, what they felt survivor leadership looks like. And the first component, which we've been talking about this entire time, is storytelling. That came up in the data as an actually strongest point, where one, as a survivor leader, they are believing in the stories of other survivors. And secondly, they're telling their own stories as survivors to educate, inform, and transform systems of oppression. The second is survivor-centered solutions, where they are listening to the needs of survivors with diverse lived experiences to build a safer world. And the third is prevention, analyzing our shared experiences to lead initiatives that prevent sexual abuse and reabuse. Advocacy is also, advocacy is also critical pursuing justice, providing encouragement, eliminating oppressive systems, and raising up other survivors and advocates to build peace. The fifth is healing, offering safe spaces for survivors to heal, grow, and thrive in their own sense of authority. And lastly, power sharing, promoting equity, positivity, and justice to uplift all communities to flourish. One of our scholars said, survivor leadership means looking through my own story and learning from the gaps to design initiatives that bring change to my community and create safer environments that hold space for girls to thrive as opposed to being abused and re-abused. And so I thought that quote just kind of symbolized all of these elements together. One of the dynamic markers of survivor leadership that I've observed um, that is different than other models of leadership is their understanding of shared power. Yesterday, we discussed how, or yesterday, last week, we discussed how internal transformation must also influence external transformation. And this also applies to the concept of power. Bell Hooks said, sometimes people try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. I'm not sure if you knew, but Maya Angelou was also a survivor. She writes about this in I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, also required reading. Um, as a child, Angelou was sexually abused and raped by her mother's boyfriend. She told her brother, who told the rest of the family, and while the boyfriend was found guilty, he was jailed for just one day. Four days later, he was murdered, and the theory is that Maya Angelou's uncles killed him. But as a result of that, Maya Angelou become, became mute for almost five years. She said, I thought my voice killed him. I killed that man because I told his name. And then I thought I would never speak again because my voice would kill anyone. At a young age, Maya understood her power so much though, so that she decided to be mute. But in the five year span that she experienced this, her listening, observing, and memorization skills improved. Her cultivating that innate known sense of power equipped her to become one of the most powerful and influential, influential poets of our time. Internally, this concept of power, we're seeing survivors reclaim power back after it's been stolen from trauma and abuse. And they're reclaiming this power back through education, awareness, leadership equipping, and mentorship support, which helps them to boost their confidence 
They're learning how to tell their story on their own terms, and they're making meaning from lived experiences that have formed and transformed their pain. And externally, as they're understanding the innate sense of power that they hold, they're sharing that sense of power with their communities, working together in a unified vision, not in competition, but in a community, community decision-making to understand what is best for the collective. They're, they desire a world that is safe for all. So church, the issue of sexual violence is not an issue about sex. And I think this false belief is what makes us really silent and uncomfortable about the topic. Tarana Burke, who's the founder of the hashtag MeToo movement, says that sexual violence is not about sex, but about power and privilege. And for some reason, I found that churches are more eager to collaborate with anti-human trafficking efforts as opposed to anti-sexual violence efforts. In Mara's story that I told last week, often childhood rape makes women more vulnerable to being trafficked. And I wonder if churches choose not to respond to anti-sexual violence efforts as readily because they would rather focus on saving women, saving women from abduction, instead of sharing power and privilege. The work of pastoral care for marginalized bodies and survivors of sexual violence requires an internal shift for us as advocates as well. We must recognize our own responsibility in these systems and the ways that we wield the power and privilege that we have. So remember Henry Nouwen's three lies, right? I am what others say, I am what I have, I am what I do, what I do. Often that manifests in shame, ego, and control. And that often, often manifests, manifests in behaviors that cause us to be complicit, protective, or in denial. So in the first line, shame causes us to be complicit to the privilege that we have, where we allow things to go the way they were, we don't want to shake things up, we're being influenced by the majority, we're saying that we're innocent, we didn't know that this happened, and we're claiming innocence without recognition of the privilege and responsibility that we have and how we can use that privilege to influence others. The second, in ego, that often manifests as protecting power. We might side with the abuser because of their authority in this world and because we want to be proximate, proximate to power. We side with them and we see this very evident with the board members and the staff members at Rodney Zacharias' Zach, Zach ministry, Bill Hybels Church, and I was even caught in the middle of a very similar thing with Chris Hewitt, who's one of the leaders in the Enneagram work in the Christian tradition. In these smaller circles, sometimes it's really easy to side with the abuser because we want to be proximate, proximate to power to preserve our own ego. Lastly, control. If we're so caught up on controlling things, if something happens, abuse happens in our church, we deny responsibility because we may not be the direct abuser, but we've caused indirect abuse through our complicit behavior or protectiveness over the abuser. We actually have the responsibility to undo this pervasive system of power and privilege, first by recognizing it and also realizing how we can form these systems into a more just and equitable way. If our egos go unchecked, we are all capable of causing great harm. But we are also capable of providing great healing. So remember the antidote to this, practicing counseling, being in community, being accountable to our community, and lastly, practicing contemplation. We need healing as pastors, as pastoral leaders. We need healing yes. if we are to bring Amen. healing to others. And the gift of contemplation and counseling and community is that these practices will also build new neuron corrections in our brains as well. Our brains can also be healed in this process of advocacy. In order to eradicate sexual violence, we must shift the harmful dynamics of power and privilege. In order to undo oppression against women, power must be shared with survivors. So church, will we recognize the power that survivors hold within them? 
For, the, for those in positions of leadership at churches and faith-based organizations, I'd like to offer a pathway to include survivors, to advocate with survivors, and to learn how to establish safe spaces with survivors. So if you're a leader or if you're within a church, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions under each of these themes and just consider it and test it against what you know in, within your organization. Mm -hmm. So in Believing Women, do we believe that the stories of survivors matter? Do we take their stories, insight, and solutions seriously by ensuring our belief is paired with action? Do we establish a safe space for survivors to be heard, providing support systems that survivors request and supporting the survivors to create solutions for healing, justice, and advocacy? Second, listen with empathy. Do we listen to survivors with empathy, compassion, and holistic care? Do we pause to listen to survivor-centered solutions rather than rushing to promote our own advocacy? Do we create the time and space for survivors to be heard without judgment, condemnation, or interrogation? Do we fund opportunities for survivors to be supported through trauma-informed counseling? And thirdly, unlearn abuse. Do we condemn any abuses that oppress, victimize, and objectify women, children, and marginalized groups? Do we choose not to tolerate abuse in any form, whether it be sexual, physical, emotional, spiritual, or psychological? Do we actively undo the harms of toxic masculinity, patriarchy, and religious power by condemning perpetrators of abuse and standing alongside survivors? Fourth, Establish safety. Do we establish safety through our policies, procedures, and values that guide our programs? Do we keep our leadership accountable? Do we promote safe boundaries amongst our community members? Do we commit to nurturing a community that is safe for all members to express their God-given dignity, voice, and vocation? And lastly, speak out. Do we provide opportunities for survivors' stories to be heard? Do we establish procedures for survivors to voice any abuses that go against our organization's mission, values, and policies? Do we have a whistleblower's policy? Do we provide safe, safe spaces for survivors to speak out or connect through creative forms of expression? Do we put our money where our mouth is and fund causes, corporations, and leaders who are ending sexual violence instead of perpetuating sexual violence? Do we spend our financial resources that support the healing and liberating leadership of survivors? This five phase, um, this five step phase is offered through our guide from silencing to uplifting the survivor's voice that I'll provide for all of you um, as a free download. And it's in the format of a um, small group Bible study or can even be led through your um, leadership team or your board members or your staff members. And it really helps to discuss and unpack some of the violences that might be occurring within your organization while also providing a clear framework and policy structure that you can implement at your church. Other resources that we have available, Pendo's Power, our first children's book is releasing this year. And if you're interested in bringing this resource to your church, we will have that available in the summertime. My book, Liberation is Here, is available where books are sold. If you buy it through Freely and Hope, uh, Freely and Hope gets 50% of that also. So that also helps. Um, I have a multitude of resources in conjunction with the book. I have a discussion guide that's free, a free download as well. And we also have a um, six session uh, video curriculum series that we produce in conjunction with Seminary Now that's available on the Seminary Now website. We also have a video curriculum for trauma-informed parenting that helps parents be more trauma-informed in their parenting practice while also responding to any specific needs that parents who are parenting child survivors may have. So if you're interested in adapting any of these frameworks or any of these curricula in your community, we'd love to connect. Our team of survivor leaders specialize in helping organizations and churches promote survivor care, survivor-centered prevention programs, and anti-sexual violence policies. 
So I will add a link in the chat where you can learn more about our consulting services. And at the individual level, if you want to partner and stand with survivors of sexual violence at Freely and Hope by investing in their leadership and healing, we want to invite you to join the Hope Circle, which is our community of monthly givers that believe survivors. Remember this diagram of holistic leadership of holistic education. Um, our Hope Circle members fund all of the attributes of holistic education, which allows our survivors to not just survive, but to thrive. And I will include the link there in the chat as well. We also welcome church partnerships as an extension of partnering in this work of communal liberation. And for those of you who are in positions of leadership and are trying to process through what this might mean for your own community, I am also very much available to support you in your leadership role, um, whether you're responding to survivors' needs in your church or you're wanting to implement better practices that promote safety and prevent abuse. Um, you can feel free to email me so that we can chat about it further. Um, in closing, in my life's work, I have observed this prophecy of survivors becoming powerful liberators um, on a daily basis. And as I witnessed their transformation, I saw a common trajectory of survivors finding their own sense of freedom, and a desire to share that freedom with others, whether that be through telling their story with survivors to give a sense of hope or working in advocacy efforts to fight against sexual violence. This is how they've chosen to redeem their experience by supporting the journey of someone else. And this act of incredible gen generosity is redemptive, moving from victim to survivor, survivor to leader, leader to advocate. And as we seek to empower survivors, we must speak into existence what they could be, not labeling them as victims, but as leaders in their own journey toward redemption. We must work to change our language to not define survivors by what they have experienced. We must instead call survivors into existence of who they truly are as leaders and liberators with autonomy and authority over their own story. We must believe not only in their stories, but in their liberation that will in turn bring liberation to us all. To close, I want to offer this final visual poem that was written by Mubanga. And this will culminate our series on liberation. Dear sister, I know you feel alone. I know you do not understand what's happening. I know it is tough. I know crying feels like the easiest thing to do. I know hurting yourself feels like the closest thing you will ever get to justice. I know you feel stuck. I know the world has defined you. I know people have made you feel it was your fault. I know the world makes you feel like you need saving. I know you question your future. I know you do not know who you really are or should be. You are not alone. I am here to walk with you. I will not be able to explain why it happened to you, but I will use my experience to reassure you that it will get better. Do not doubt your strength. It will carry you through. The shame is not yours to carry. Justice is letting the perpetrator carry it. You are not to blame. You did not ask for it. Your clothes had nothing to do with what happened. This does not describe you. There is more to you. I cannot wait for you to witness who you really are. This world has been unfair to a number of women, which in return produced a number of voices amplified. We are your back. We will stand with you. We will fight with you. We will show you that it is beautiful to express yourself. We will use our voices for you until you can. We will protect you until you are ready to be at the forefront. And at the end, you and I and every other woman who has redefined womanhood will create a safe world for the next generation. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Lynn. Please join me.
All right. Uh, let me get comfortable for um, the next several minutes and, and definitely enjoy engaging with you on, on this lecture. Um, where to begin? I've got several things. Uh, we're trying to get through all of them, this number, like six or seven things, but we'll take them in order. But I think I'd like to begin with the word transcend, transcendence. Uh, you mentioned you, you talked about Judith Herman there and, and citing her and talking about minority, there's a minority portion of people who seek to transcend, um, whereas most, most folks might not do that by engaging in the wider world. And as I heard it, I was thinking, wow, you're describing PSR students perfectly. Uh, everyone who, who comes to PSR is a student um, who seeks to transcend whatever it is they brought, they brought them here. And sometimes it's painful. Good things bring people here too. But a lot of our community is about healing ourselves as we seek to heal others. So that's exactly what PSR um, is about. And um, so transcendence, I just want to be clear. I think the common definition of it is somehow you transcend, you leave it behind, right? You leave whatever it is you transcend, you, you, you discard it, right? It's a discarding uh, uh, aspect to it in the common understanding. So I want to be clear, I think, and I think you are saying this as well, that transcendence means going through, dragging along, bringing with you everything that you've been through in order to make it useful uh, in the wider world and also heal yourself and be healed, be healed in the process, not healing yourself, but being healed in the process of doing the work. My course read uh, an article that invoked uh, or used a uh, scholar named Emmanuel Levinas, Orthodox Jewish thinker, 20th century. Anyway, he has this, uh, this he uses the word transcendence a lot, but he, and so let's get back to the particular versus the universal. Or the particular and the universal. We talked about that a little bit last week. And Levinas talks about the wound as a half opening. And the reason it's a half opening is that all suffering is absolutely peculiar and particular and cannot be compared with any other suffering. Absolutely, I don't want to say individualistic, but absolutely. Uh, inherent in the particular person is unique. Knowing that, then, eliminates the need for any competition. You mentioned competition a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Eliminating the competition allows for the possibility of a connection through the interhuman, through the trace, which I love now, so I like to use this word trace, right. this leftover part that, that cannot be contained fully. Uh, and so, that is the transcendence. That's how the particular reaches the universal. Um, so when, let, me, let me ask you this one question. Is that your understanding in terms of your work? I mean, this is a different language, but would you, would you hear something in common there? And then also, are you um, on the lookout for any superimpositions of the universal onto the particular? In your work, that is to say, something comes from outside and says, "Boom! This is how it's supposed to be. This is what liberation looks like." And if it doesn't look like that for you, then you're doing something wrong. Just want to be cautious about it. Yeah, I really appreciate that definition, especially to say that without competition, you can have connection. And in spiritual practice, connection is that healing element that actually brings us closer to ourselves and to each other in context of the community. I definitely see transcendence in that same way. I would describe it as rising above the experiences to not forget, as Judith Herman also said, to forget you might repeat it, right? Which is why the constant telling of the story, the constant raising of education and awareness, such as through these platforms, helps us to keep it at the forefront so that we know how to dismantle it better each time we tell the story, to negate it, to silence it, to forget it, I think would mean to lose its potential power. And so what I believe transcendence means is to cultivate that power that can be birthed from pain and suffering. And in that cultivation process, emerge with something completely new that is beyond you. And that's where that communal connection can reach 
healing attributes beyond you. Um, yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, the um, the other thing that came to mind, that comes to mind as you're, as you're speaking, you were speaking about Judith Herman, uh, is this idea, I think she mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong, that somehow uh, spirituality is another, is a step, right? It's, it's something along the work process of healing. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, though, is that here at PSR, I mean, we, there's an element of faith and mystery in all this. See, that's the, that I think is the part that often gets lost in the wider discourse about a lot of this stuff. Because, you know, you're trying to manufacture or mechanize this kind of transformation or transcendence. And it really can't be done. It's right. a mystery. So that's why you go through the faith. If you don't know what's going to happen, but letting go of the control over what might happen in the process is what, ironically, does the work. Yeah. Right? It's a sense of irony. So, um, we work with spirituality as meaning making. Uh, PSR. I think I, I'm going to take a guess and think that, uh, and suppose that Judith Herman's referring to religion per se as maybe one of the avenues that people might seek to to go towards healing. But spirituality was that whole process of, of the way we we work with it. Was that whole process of meaning making all the way through? That's spirituality. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, let me, let me, um, but let me weave in one other thing, because you said it on page 167, I love this part about, three, through this work, 167 of her, of her book, Liberation, is here, through this work, I found liberation from bondage, I didn't realize I was in. Precisely what it means to go through the programs here at PSI. Uh, and I love the word work. Our students study, they pray, but more than anything else, they work. That is the magic, the working. You're out there doing something in the world that transforms you. So that's the new model of theological education is working, not just studying the text, right? That's why we're contextual. So, uh, yeah, I just want to see how that all that resonates with you. Yeah, I mean, this is why I think I love this song because <laughs> I, I resonate with your um, methodology so much. So, and, yeah. and my only regret is that I can't actually engage with the students. And I know that's the purpose of this type of lecture, but hopefully, y'all will reach out to me yeah. in other forums um, so that um, I could learn more about your particular process. Um, I I feel so with Judith Herman's. Um, Quote, she did say that the process, and she did mention it was a process where she's in her research, survivors are recognizing both political and spiritual practice as part of the process toward um, uh, activating social action. So spirituality is a process. In post-traumatic growth, spirituality is one of the five key components, and it says spirituality, not religion. And I think this is where sometimes Christians might get kind of caught up and be like, oh, no, it's only Christianity. Can you heal through Christ, right? <laughs> and, it, and I think that's where we get it wrong, because I think I mentioned this in previous lectures. Um, a lot of our survivors have been abused by folks in the church. Pastors youth leaders, worship leaders, those are the words, sorry to say, but there is because of that sense of power and privilege that we place on church leaders, right? Some folks abuse that power and privilege. And so when we're working in a very Christian context um, at Freely and Hope, as we've been colonized, but, um, and they've also experienced abuse in Christian context, I think that's where new understanding a new language of what spirituality of the unknown and of the mystery is so critical to their healing because if we only box it into Christianity and religion and the traditions that we've been raised in, then I, for, I think we go through these motions not understanding that these spiritual practices can be healing. And that's why I keep mentioning as leaders, how can we be intentional mm -hmm. to ensure that the rituals are not just do the thing here and there, sing the song done, but that we are issuing and ushering these spiritual practices for the purpose of healing and transformation so that those that are present can take what they may. Again, not to enforce, be like, this will heal your brain, go, right? Yeah. But to be like, let's offer, let's invite, let's provide 
opportunities of spiritual practice that can lend toward healing and allow folks to resonate as it will. And, and to your point of, you know, the universal coming down, that's exactly it. We can't say these Christian practices are essential to our Christian faith, therefore you must pray. And I write in my book, when I was on my deathbed, I'm over-exaggerating, but when I was in the hospital in Zambia, I literally could not pray the way that I was taught to pray. There you go. And so that's my experience. And I know with the survivors too, they all have different, different practices. Some of them don't go to church. Some of them do. Some of them um, are practicing other other spiritual practices that they didn't before, some of them are reverting back to spiritual practices that they did that their grandmothers did before, right? So I think that's where in the in the particular, right, the unique experience of every survivor or really every person who's going through their own healing journey is um finding what resonates for you in that season mm -hmm. and letting that sense of connection be your divine healing. Um, and then for us as institution or as the leaders ensuring that we're not universalizing and saying, well, um, I really love, let's say, praise and worship, but let's say, I really love praise and worship, y'all got to do praise and worship, and that will be the only method, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, having multiple ways of experiencing God and allowing the mystery and the faith and the unknown speaks to people in different ways. Wonderful. Wow, amen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to take just a couple minutes and squeeze something else in here. And we're definitely going to try and get to student questions in a moment. Uh, Dean Abraham, uh, uh, we've we got some things on, on the pipeline. I don't see any questions. Uh, I'm waiting for some thoughts and reflections from people. Okay. Lots of thank you to you, Nicole. Uh, it's been wonderful. But thank you. let's have some discussion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yes, please, if you want to have any questions, uh, please do, because I'm having a lot of a bit we have time. Seven. Yeah, we have seven, seven things here. We got through two. We got through two. Uh, but just on this one point about uh, you mentioned proximate to power or proximity to power. And the, the more conservative evangelical brothers and sisters and 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 by non-binary by non-binary folks in our Christian uh, family in the right of religious right seem to have made that that deal. Uh, and transforming. So I don't want to get into necessarily that. But I'm just wondering. You mentioned some folks anyway. You named some names. So names, yeah. Uh, I'm just going with that. And uh, it sounds as if you might you're seeing some troubling signs in, in the evangelical world. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point of the the universal right of Christian faith is to say evangelical Christianity has it right. This is our method and approach. We're gonna spend a lot of money on smoke machines and lights for the for the arena. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna spend a lot of money on marketing dollars to get new people through the doors. We're going to focus on conversion as opposed to deep internal transformation. We're going to boost the leader in authority as opposed to establishing um, leaders from marginalized communities, right? So I think that's what I am calling for in a pushback against. Um, evangelical institutions that many of, of us have been harmed by. Um, the folks that I mentioned, it, their sense of leadership did come from a place of ego, power, privilege, and money. And that's how they were able to get away with what they had gotten away with for so long. Multiple survivors, multiple survivors. And I did say, you know, I had an experience where in friendship with um, my former mentor, Chris Hewitt, who actually introduced me to um, contemplative practices. You know what I'm saying? We could teach people all we want about these wonderful spiritual practices, but if it's not coming out in action, right, if it's not in alignment with our action, then what are we really doing if we're preaching one thing but abusing other people? And for me, and I'm saying this because I think all of us need to be aware of our relationships, right? We might be keeping certain friendships or, some, or certain people on staff or in positions of authority and leadership because of the power that they hold. Mm -hmm. Because we want to be proximate, proximate to their power, to their perceived power, right? Um, we might be holding on to relationships longer than we need to be. And I found myself in that situation where over a 10-year period of friendship with Chris Hewitt, 
um, recognized that he was actually abusing two of my friends, right? And so in that recognition, how will I now use my voice, use my story, use my stance, even though I didn't have experience any abuse personally, use my advocacy as a way to side with the survivors and to remove myself from that very toxic and manipulative relationship. I didn't know it, right? But it was actually one of the survivors that told me, you are keeping this relationship because of the benefits that you get in the relationship. And I had to think about that for a moment. I was like, you're right. And so I had to do a whole, pro this is another yep. lecture, uh, yeah. but a whole process on how do you call out perpetrators? What is the process for the organization? Mm -hmm. Process for even me as a former friend. My name is on his book, so I kind of have to clear my name of that too. And then in relationship and in reconciliation with survivors, how do I then ensure that my relationships are always siding with survivors and that I'm listening to their feedback and learning from it? Wonderful. Um, not wonderful that it happened. I'm so sorry that it did occur uh, within, within your experience and that it occurred within the family generally. Um, but what you are, are the, what you just did, uh, just right here, just right now, this process, this, this uh, autobiographical, um, you know, uh, sort of pairing. We talk a lot of PSR about, um, well, one of the things we, we try to get students to do is to think about themselves, uh, prepare themselves for public consumption. I think I mentioned this sort of at the beginning. And journaling uh, is one of the ways we do that. And sometimes in my courses, I like to encourage people to journal. Here's why. Journaling is not the raw data of dumping the raw data, all this the, the, the stuff from you know one's experiences onto the page. That is not journaling. If anything, that might be a diary, a thing that's a recording, but journaling is a process of making meaning, self-writing, creating oneself by um, putting oneself out there on the page. And so what you just did was sort of a, a, a process of that, just in sharing. It's clear that you've made meaning out of your experience. You're able to communicate it publicly. I mean, you have the raw data, of course. It's not like it doesn't that disappear. But somehow, not somehow, but you actually do work. You made it popular, yeah, to all of us. And so with that, I want to ask you, uh, how was writing this book? You, you have all these uh, uh, visual poems and things like, was this book also redemptive and healing for you? Uh, was it part of your healing process? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned journaling because all those poems came from journals. Um, that were private, and some I made public on like little Instagram stories. And so it was interesting when I was writing the book and like telling the linear narrative of my journey, I was pulling from old journal entries and looking at the date and looking at my Instagram posts at the date and like, oh my God, that's what I was going through when that had happened, right? So it's interesting the alignment. So most of the poems, not all, but most of them do kind of align within that season that I was in in that particular time. Um, and I will say putting it together was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. For those of you who have written a book, it's like the worst experience ever, but also the most redemptive. And it was particularly hard because, you know, as a former filmmaker, I'm so used to telling the stories of others that I couldn't find my own story in the process. And my very first draft. I sent it to my, my community, my crew, my accountability community, who are um, majority survivors, all different diversities. And they were all like, where are you? Where are you in your book? <laughs> right? And I was like, what do you mean? I'm saying I'm there. I'm saying I was at the house. I'm saying I did this, I did that. I was like, no. Where are you and your thoughts and experiences and your processes in, in, in the book? And that's where it's really hard. And like other authors talk about this a lot as well in terms of how do you tell your own story in the context of other stories? And how do you ensure that you're giving honor to the other stories while still being truthful to your own experience as the writer? That was hard. And that's where the book had gone through several revisions with survivors. Um, some of them mentioned in the book, others that are um, not mentioned so that I had a more holistic view of, of um, folks looking at it so that I'm ensuring that everything that I'm doing is held accountable to survivors, whether they're mentioned or whether they're in other positions of leadership like me so that they can see themselves or their stories of survivors um, represented in a way that felt fitting. So 
Um, that was part of the process. I do feel it was extremely helpful to give language to what I had experienced personally. When I told the story two weeks ago about my my uh, illness and PTSD, yes. I couldn't verbally say it until I had written it in the book. And interestingly, um, I submitted those chapters as the proposal because I felt this is the dirtiest, darkest of my secrets. And if the proposal, if and if the um, if the proposal comes through because of that piece, then it must be important. So I had to be willing to, I guess, like tell the dirtiest, darkest part of me um, in a public way before writing the rest of the book and allowing that to be up for, yeah, public critique and being okay with that was also part of the process. Oh my goodness! Yes, no, thank you so much. I, I'm, can do we have we have this recorded? Yes. So I'm going to pay this back. <laughs> this is how it's done, right? This is how how uh, spiritual formation happens. You got accountability. You have a, a a crowd of people who are witnessing you and and holding you accountable in this process, in your formation process, in your revelation. Um. So, I do have a question, Leonard. Oh, you do have a question. Okay, great. Please. Well, uh, there there is one question in the student chat and a comment, and the comment is from Holly Mers. Thank you, Holly. Uh, speaking about how anxiety really needs to be uh, needs healing and help and not repentance and effort, which uh, in an overly religious context or spiritualized culture, uh, that's how it is uh, supposed to be dealt with. So that's an excellent comment there. Uh, but a great question from Michelle, which is what would you say are some hallmarks of toxic culture that tend to go unseen? That will be another lecture, but <laughs> I would love to send more resources to everybody. Yeah, this, that's a whole other lecture. I will say, and um, I'll say this from my personal experience with Chris Hewitt's because, um, oh God, there's so many. But what, what I will say became one of the, um, I guess, points of transformation for me in my relationship with him was realizing that the way he was treating me as an Asian woman and the way that he was treating other Asian women was vastly different. And that's what I'm saying about um, in context of community, how we are treating other people, both in public and private life, ensuring that the way that we treat other people matches what, what we say. Um, so that was, that was a big one because what I observed of him was that in his public life, he surrounded himself intentionally as a white man with young people of color. And there were about three of us, two Asian, and I think Asian women. And we were kind of that safe space for him to say like, oh, these people vouch for me, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there were these other Asian women that had experienced abuse from him. And so once I recognized that the way that he was treating people in two different, completely different ways, um, that, that was not okay with me. That was not okay with me. And he was definitely using me like as a pawn to say like, oh, but, but these women of color vouch for me, so it's okay. So I think that's a big one. Um, and I mentioned this, the, the, the merging of the public and private life. I think from his example, I learned even for myself, like, how are my private relationships also indicative of my public relationships? So um, with him um, and even with others, right? If I am going to publicly denounce friendship or separation or no longer approve, um, no longer endorsing his work as I previously did, then also privately my relationships also need to be in alignment with what I say and do in terms of um, supporting survivors. So that's one really big one, I think, which is also kind of going back to our first course of um, recognizing dignity of all people, right? Treating all, all people with the same level of care and respect. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, and just, uh, if I may, I'd like to just end on a couple of notes because just a couple of, of um, housekeeping things to say. One, uh, Ms. Lim is, um, would like to email all of us, all of the students, everyone, uh, to share the resources that she mentioned. So I just want to let you know that that is something we can do or we'd yeah, like to do. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, not risk. Yeah, yeah. And if you do not do want to opt out, just email me, and you know we'll we'll take care of that. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and um, uh, share with Ms. Lynn all the emails so that she can email you and share more resources. And hopefully, you will contact her as she as she so um, generously offered. A couple words. Uh, one is. Uh, that there is, as we as we talk about here at PSR, well, at least I mentioned here at PSR, uh, really no such thing as the private versus the public, right? There is the deeply personal yes. versus, the, you know, and the public, so to speak, right? There's that, you, you, you want to, it depends on the relationship, whether you reveal that, but private always impacts the public self. Yep. So that's wonderful that you, uh, that you're able to, uh, live that out. And so I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join me for another time. Thank you. And I must add my thanks to you too, uh, uh, Ms. Nicole Lim. This was absolutely fantastic. But uh, again, from my perspective and from where I sit, I would like to do, uh, provide some official thanks to the following people. To Leonard, for sure, for leading us so well in these discussions and for hosting us. Thank you so very much. To Ken Watson for his wonderful treats that he brought, and I'm not there to enjoy it today, but thank you so much. Uh, to Tara, Assistant Dean Tara Weeks, who is behind the scenes, but uh, managing all the technology. To Hallie Freed, Christopher Gonzalez, and Kimberly Griffith, who also helped with the marketing, with uh, the setting, uh, and with a lot of work that goes you know, unnoticed very often. And someone we all see, but rarely you know, register uh, as to how important he really is, is Marco, who's, who's hanging out outside, but without him, the classrooms wouldn't go back to what classrooms should look like. And he does the work quietly and well. And then, of course, to President David Vasquez Levy, who's on his uh, way back uh, to the Bay Area from San Antonio, uh, because I think uh, President David met you first, uh, Nicole. And I remember him coming back saying, I met, I met a wonderful person. We've got to get her here as a professor of practice. And this was a while back. So I want to thank him, too, for his efforts in getting you. And thank you, all students. It has been wonderful to walk with you these four weeks. All best to you, uh, Nicole, as you go along, and we look forward to your continued association with the uh, Pacific School of Religion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.